All philosophers suffer from the same defect, in that they start with present-day man and think they can arrive at their goal by analyzing him. Instinctively, they let man hover before them as an eterna veritas, something unchanging in all turmoil, a secure measure of things. But everything the philosopher asserts about man is basically no more than a statement about man within a very limited time span. A lack of historical sense is the congenital defect of all philosophers. Some unwittingly even take the most recent form of man as it developed under the imprint of certain religious or even political events as the fixed form from which one must proceed. They will not understand that man has evolved, that the faculty of knowledge has also evolved, while some of them even permit themselves to spin the whole world from out of this faculty of knowledge. End quote. That's from Human All Too Human, the first book, and it's from section two, the section titled The Congenital Defect of All Philosophers, which is the title we've taken for this episode. Nietzsche liked to call out philosophers as a group, uh, often writing of the errors of philosophers or the prejudices of philosophers. But this coinage here, um, in what is, uh, in my opinion, this is his most, it's his first significant full-length book, and it's it's my favorite coinage of his for talking about this issue. Um, a congenital defect is a, it's another term for a birth defect, some kind of disability or malformity which you are settled with from the time that you are born. And so, you know, some people might be born without limbs or born blind, you know, without the faculty of sight, whatever the case may be. And so what is the case when it comes to philosophers in Dr. Nietzsche's diagnosis? Well, Nietzsche here says that all philosophers are born without a historical sense. That is their birth defect. Just as some children might be born blind, unable to see, philosophers are born, so to speak, unable to think historically. What Nietzsche means by thinking historically here uh, is something sp specific. He means historical in an extended sense of the word, um, not really in the sense of the discipline of history, um, which itself is only concerned with, you know, what is evolutionarily speaking, very, very recent history. Nietzsche is concerned with, you know, a biological or almost like a geological scale that sense of the word history. Having a historical sense means, first and foremost, recognizing that all recorded history is by its very nature extremely recent history. And so he elaborates on this further in the same passage in the next paragraph. Quote, Everything essential in human development occurred in primeval times long before those 4,000 years with which we are more or less familiar. Man probably hasn't changed much more in the, those years, but the philosopher sees instincts in present-day man and assumes they belong to the unchangeable facts of human nature, and that they can, to that extent, provide a key to the understanding of the world in general. This entire teleology is predicated on the ability to speak about man of the last 4,000 years as if he were eternal, the natural direction of all things in the world from the beginning. But everything has evolved. There are no eternal facts, nor are there absolute truths. Thus, historical philosophizing is necessary henceforth, and the virtue of modesty as well. End quote. And so, notice that in challenging the philosophers and the assumptions that they undertake in doing philosophy, Nietzsche goes on to attack the very notion of eternal facts. The historical sense that philosophers lack is not just a sense that mankind as an animal evolved and is ever evolving, but that the world itself, for whatever that might mean, is also evolving. This is a vision of an ever-dynamic world. Um, you know, e even though that dynamism may not be apparent to us, you know, as we, we attribute stability to this handful of millennia that's so important to all humankind, um, so this is a Heraclitian vision of the world that Nietzsche is putting forward, a world of becoming, 
There is no eterna veritas, which means, of course, eternal truth. And, you know, certainly humanity and the human condition, as we understand it and experience it today, is not necessarily revealing of anything about mankind as such, or life as such, or the world as such. Um, And since all philosophers are born with this defect, they fail to realize this. And so what do philosophers do? They take the example of what is near to them, the example of mankind within their own their own society, for example, or the example of historical events or great people. You know what what man has done within. You know Nietzsche says past thousands of years, but we might even say the past few hundred years or even the past few decades, and then they draw these far-reaching conclusions about what people are like. Philosophers observe what is going on during their particular time and their particular place. And from those goings on, they draw conclusions. Nietzsche's uh, introduction of the idea of the historical sense would leave a philosopher to recognize that those conclusions are, at best, provisional. They're temporary. The observations we can glean about mankind today, the truths that we can arrive at, these are perspectival truths. They seem to be absolutely certain from our perspective, here and now, but are, in fact, limited by circumstances. There's a passage in Beyond Good and Evil that expands on this. Um, So, you know, thus far we've said the world is an evolving thing, but the actual reality that uh, we philosophize about is is ever-changing. But in Beyond Good and Evil, Aphorism 20, Nietzsche says that our philosophies are not autonomously evolving, Our ideas are not these living things that grow on their own. And he says they're not even uh, capricious, you know, as in we we don't even pull philosophical ideas out of the ether as if by whim. Rather, he writes, quote, They nevertheless belong just as much to a system as all the members of the fauna of a continent, end quote. Um, That's referring to our ideas. In other words, philosophers keep exploring the same territory. He, he, he writes further, quote, The most diverse philosophers keep filling in a definite fundamental scheme of possible philosophies. Under an invisible spell, they always revolve once more in the same orbit. However, independent of each other, they may feel themselves with their critical or systematic wills. Something within them leads them. Something impels them in definite order, one after the other. To wit the innate systematic structure and relationship of their concepts, end quote. Now, why would, why would that be the case? We have this dynamic world with no eternal truths, but philosophers, with their congenital defect, they keep retreading the same territory over and over again. Why? Um, Nietzsche points here to the fact that, for one, uh, we're all children of civilization, of this project of civilization that's only been taking place for a couple thousand years. But more importantly, as he goes on to talk about in the passage, he points to language. Um, We could probably do a whole episode just on language um, and the Nietzschean estimation of the importance of language to our thought. But the, the short explanation given in this aphorism is that philosophers who philosophize in the same language, or even in the same family of languages, will often be confronted by the same philosophical problems, by the same familiar contradictions and dialectics, because the shape of our thought is set by language, more or less. And so even in Indian philosophy, we see many of the same familiar patterns in Nietzsche's view as we see in the Greek or even in German philosophy, because Indic languages are the the great grandmother language um, of many of the European tongues, including Germanic. And Nietzsche, interestingly, he speculates that the Ural-Altic languages might offer the possibility of, uh, you know, a philosopher arising who proceeds in quite a different direction, because, as he says, the idea of the subject is least developed in those languages. So with less of a foothold for the idea of being, Nietzsche wonders if maybe you might be able to explore different philosophical territory. But again, to come back to the point, the issue he's pointing at here elucidates the same core criticism of philosophy, that we're bounded by the perspective that we inherit. So this doesn't just include our set of experiences or our cultural assumptions. Rather, the very way that we think is almost hopelessly fated to produce the same errors or the same prejudices, because our linguistic rules, which are 
part and parcel with our cognitive rules, um, they do not present themselves as perspectival and arbitrary. In fact, they're so deeply intuitive that, in general, we can't even imagine what thinking would be without them. And so language is delimiting our cognitive horizons, but that very fact of that limitation is not clear to us. And so the provisional nature of our thoughts doesn't tend to reveal itself. In fact, it's the opposite. We believe that the way we think is actually a revelation of absolutes. Um, An example would be in philosophy, the laws of logic. So these are, um, you know, I'll just sort of rattle them off. The law of identity, that's a thing is itself. The law of non-contradiction, a thing cannot be not itself at the same place at the same time. And then there's the law of excluded middle. A thing cannot be neither itself nor not itself. Uh, it must be one or the other. These laws are generally taken as axiomatic. Ar- Aristotle said specifically of the law of non-contradiction that it was the most certain of all propositions. Um, and I would actually argue from that law alone, the law of non-contradiction, you could actually extrapolate the other two. And there have been a lot of philosophers that have gotten quite a bit of mileage out of just seeing what logical conclusions they can draw just strictly from the law of non-contradiction. There is no way to argue against these laws of logic within the framework of Western philosophy and within the English language. If you try to argue against the laws of logic, you will be, by definition, uh, being illogical. You'll be making an illogical argument, and therefore the argument won't hold water. It won't be valid or sound. And more importantly, it probably won't persuade anyone. Now, consider what I just said. Is that proof that the laws of logic are unassailable? I mean, that's what the Western intuition says. You cannot argue against this without contradicting yourself. And therefore, it's unassailable. It's absolute. Nietzsche's counterpoint is, the fact that you cannot argue against these laws doesn't reveal that the laws themselves are absolute, but rather that your thinking is relative. You think in terms that are relative to these laws as a framework. So hopefully I haven't belabored the point too much, but I think that's this is all important to cover. Our philosophy, shaped by our perspective, purports to reveal these eternal truths, but our tru- truths only seem eternal or absolute because they are self-evident within our given perspective, and we can't escape that perspective. And that perspective is our time and place, our culture, and our language. Now, so there's a correlate to this congenital defect of philosophers, the lack of historical sense, which we may say um, this correlate flows naturally forth from this defect. Because philosophers lack the historical sense, they're prone to a series of pitfalls in their thinking, and perhaps the best summary of the general character of these errors is that our reasoning tends to start from a conclusion, or from an effect, or we might say, from the present situation, and then move backward to the syllogism, to the cause, to the thing we imagine must be the justification for the present situation. And this idea is first drawn out by Nietzsche in Human All to Human, section 30, um, which is a very important aphorism, so I'm going to kind of take it piece by piece. Uh, it's called Bad Habits in Making Conclusions. Quote, The most common false conclusions of men are these. A thing exists, therefore it is legitimate. Here, one is concluding functionality from viability and legitimacy from functionality. So, end quote. Just to disentangle that idea. A thing exists, therefore it is legitimate. What does that mean? Oh, in the second part, you know, he says, one's concluding functionality from viability and legitimacy from functionality. So, viability... The mere fact of something existing or persisting leads us to believe that it serves some function, which is, in Nietzsche's view, what he's pointing out, that's a hidden premise in our thinking. Uh, the root words here, uh, or the, the, the original German, 
that uh, this is translated from. Um, so he's saying when he says uh, we, do, we, we, we conclude functionality from viability, uh, the term for functionality is zwek masigkeit, and uh, viability is lebens fahikeit. So zweg masigkeit. Zweck is a goal, and uh, Lebens obviously relates to life. So something is alive, or viable, you might say. It, it exists, it's a being, and therefore it must exist for some purpose. And then we derive from this purpose, this Zweck Masigkeit, the idea of a thing's Recht Masigkeit, or legitimacy. What does this mean? Well, Recht means right. Or correct. Um, I've, I've, I saw uh, in one dictionary definition, "rect masikite" could mean legality, but I think what what we're really what the meaning here is rightness or correctness. And so, what is Nietzsche describing? So, in our thinking, we're confronted with. Um, we'll use an example. We're confronted with a feeling or an intuition or an experience. So, for example, the feeling of guilt or bad conscience. We use this um, because it it relates to a passage we've talked about in the previous episodes um, that we'll we'll look at again in this one. So one experiences guilt, and from the fact that the guilt is happening, you know, there it is, I feel it, it's real, one assumes that the guilt is legitimate, that it's correct. What do we mean here by legitimate? Um, That something's happening for what we might call a good reason, that the guilt exists for a purpose, and therefore, it is valid. It has a valid reason for existing. What Nietzsche is pointing out is, is that this thinking is based on all these hidden premises. If something exists, it must serve some function. And if it serves some function, it must be legitimate. And so back to the text. Uh, quote, Furthermore, if an opinion makes us glad, it must be true. If its effect is good, it in itself must be good and true. Here one is attributing to the effect the predicate gladdening, good, in the sense of the useful, and providing the cause with the predicate good, but now in the sense of the logically valid. The reversal of this proposition is, if a thing cannot prevail and maintain itself, it must be wrong. If an opinion tortures and agitates, it must be false. The free spirit, who comes to know all too well the error of this sort of deduction and has to suffer from its consequences, often succumbs to the temptation of making contrary deductions, which are in general naturally just as false. If a thing cannot prevail, it must be good. If an opinion troubles and disturbs, it must be true. End quote. And so this passage lays the groundwork for a lot of Nietzsche's um, psychological observations about philosophers. And, you know, of course, about religion and about society and its moral values. He, be, he began to approach ideas and moral systems from the angle of assessing why someone would believe this rather than strictly assessing whether a statement was logically valid or not. And what he finds is that, to put it bluntly, and perhaps in maybe an oversimplified way, people are going to believe what they want to believe what it feels good to believe. And so repeatedly throughout Nietzsche's work, he assesses a, a, a given philosophical assertion, and then quite aside from the question of its validity, he uh, accuses people of making the assertion because it is pleasurable, or gladdening as he puts it. And so notice again, Nietzsche's critique here is concerned with language, how we confuse ourselves with what we might call mixed predicates. Predicates which carry the same linguistic symbol in our language or in our family of languages. So good meaning both gladdening and good meaning logically valid. And Nietzsche is careful to point out that just because gladdening and logically valid um, actually have no necessary correlation, that doesn't mean they have an opposing relationship either. Um, In fact, he puts this very bluntly towards the end of Human All to Human. Um, This is aphorism 517. It's one of my favorite Nietzschean sayings. Um, I think I may have quoted it before in the episode on truth, but here it is anyway. Quote, there is no pre-established harmony between the furthering of truth and the good of mankind. End quote. So that's Nietzsche talking about the reality as he sees it. 
And yet, in the passage we've been dissecting, bad habits and making conclusions, he's pointing out that, be that as it may, our thinking is inclined towards conflating those things, truth and goodness. Because the meaning of terms, such as valid or legitimate, are double meanings and can always carry the connotation of being either logically valid or morally valid, for example. Now, we've just brought these mixed up predicates into the light, so to speak, so nothing to worry about, right? Well, I think you'll find that these bad habits are just that. They're habitual. Habits aren't broken simply by virtue of the fact that you're aware of them, are they? Anyone who's had a strong habit they tried to break should know this. Just because you're aware of your smoking habit doesn't mean you can quit smoking by that token alone, just by being aware of it. These habitual patterns of thinking are just as pernicious and just as addictive as anything. Um, And so here, I think it would be useful to recall um, that aphorism I mentioned earlier that we discussed in a past episode. I think I've actually brought this up in two past episodes, making this now the most brought up aphorism on the podcast, but it's a real important one because it touches on the edges of so many core issues for Nietzsche. That's aphorism 39 of the same book, Human All to Human where Nietzsche is challenging Schopenhauer's idea of intelligible freedom. Schopenhauer admitted, along with Nietzsche, that man's actions weren't free, Um, not in the sense of a libertarian free will. There's no a-causal force of the mind acting as a voluntary governor over one's actions. But Schopenhauer did believe that man had a freedom over his nature. So your nature is what dictates your actions. You don't have this strictly free will over your actions, but you do have some level of volition in shaping your own nature. Um, Why? Schopenhauer takes it as evidence for man's freedom that we experience displeasure after doing immoral deeds. In other words, guilt, the phenomenon we discussed earlier. So Nietzsche in this aphorism in 39 of Human All to Human criticizes this idea. Um, and so I'll quote, quote this aphorism from the fact of man's displeasure. Schopenhauer thinks he can prove that man somehow must have had a freedom, a freedom which did not determine his actions, but rather determined his nature freedom. That is to be this way or the other, not to act this way or the other man becomes that which he wants to be. His volition precedes his essence or sorry, precedes his existence. In this case, we are concluding falsely that we can deduce the justification, the rational admissibility of this displeasure from the fact that it exists. And from this false deduction, Schopenhauer arrives at his fantastic conclusion of so-called intelligible freedom, end quote. So again, I'm bringing this up again because notice the formula Nietzsche is employing. Schopenhauer displays bad habits and drawing conclusions. A thing exists, therefore it is legitimate. Nietzsche goes on to say that, in fact, in actuality, displeasure, um, you know, or bad conscience or guilt is actually not rational because it rests on errors in thinking. It's the false idea that the deed was freely chosen and not something that necessarily had to happen. Nietzsche thinks that all things do actually necessarily have to happen, which means that such a feeling of guilt is totally illegitimate. It's invalid, actually, as in logically it's invalid. And so he accuses even his his mentor, Schopenhauer, of having the philosophical birth defect. And so this is is because Schopenhauer takes it for granted that the feeling of guilt is legitimate, the feeling of displeasure after the deed, as he says. Why does Schopenhauer take it for granted? Well, because we all take it for granted within our moral universe, which has been fostered by Christianity. Um, You know, and that's what I mean when I say this is habitual. It's not It's something you just become aware of and decide to stop doing. This is in you. It's inculcated into all of us. And so, but importantly, this is where the historical sense comes in. As Nietzsche says, this feeling wasn't experienced, this displeasure, it wasn't experienced by earlier people from different places and times after they did the same deeds. I use the example of um, the Spartans of ancient Greece in a a past episode. I don't quite remember when. But the Spartans practiced infanticide as a matter of course. They practiced um, homosexuality in a form that was more more or less mandatory. um, And they brutally oppressed the helots, whom they enslaved and declared war on every year. 
um, they didn't feel guilt about any of this in the way that, you know, we or various other different societies on earth might have felt guilt about some or all of these things. Um, they lived in a different moral universe than we do. But the congenital defect of philosophers is that the perspectival nature of our moral universe is hidden from us. And we feel instead that our thoughts and feelings and experiences are these means of understanding absolute truths. To take this from the, the realm of abstract philosophy and into more practical terms, I feel, you know, I should note that in human alter human, it's, it's full of Nietzsche's indictments on the social conventions and institutions of his own society and European society more broadly. Um, and there's too much there to cover, you know, all of it in the episode. I mean, it's, that's the substance of the entire book. So <laughs> it's Nietzsche taking this general framework for critiquing ideas and applying it to religion, ethics, the state, the family, etc. But I, I've, I've gone ahead and I picked out an aphorism that makes clear how this prejudice works in actual practice or how this er, these errors of thought works in a, actual practice uh, of taking the predicate good as in gladdening and confusing it with good as in logically valid or true. And so this is aphorism 227, which is called reason or unreason deduced from the consequences. And uh, I'll be quoting from it in an abridged form. Quote, All states and social arrangements, class, marriage, education, law, acquire strength and permanence solely because of the faith of bound spirits in them. They exist, then, in the absence of reasons. Christianity, which was very innocent in its intellectual ideas, demanded faith and nothing but faith, and passionately rejected the desire for reasons. It pointed to the successful result of faith, You'll soon discover the advantage of faith, it suggested. You'll be blessed because of it. The state, in fact, does the same thing, and each father raises his son in the same way. Just take this to be true, he says. You'll discover how good it feels. But this means that the truth of an opinion should be proved by its personal benefit. The usefulness of a teaching should guarantee its intellectual certainty and substantiation. This is as if... The defendant were to say in court, My defender is telling the whole truth, for just see what happens as a result of his plea. I am acquitted. End quote. And I love the example at the end because it shows how logic is being made to work backward in order to justify our cherished beliefs. When, we, when we're able to be detached and consider such an example of backwards logic from a distance, you know, from an objective view, we immediately spot the error but we don't spot it in our own thinking. So here we're going to change gears and uh, I'd like to jump into another work. This is a well-known section of Nietzsche's book, The Twilight of Idols, called The Four Great Errors. Now, I thought about doing a whole episode just on The Four Great Errors, um, but I, I decided against it because in many ways, these four errors are simply a reformulation of many of the things that we've been talking about up to this point in this episode. And um, they are, to some extent, a retreading of some of the ground we've already covered on causality and free will. And in fact, I've actually quoted from the section in the episode on free will. But that being said, I think re-examining the whole section in the context of the congenital defect of philosophers and their bad habits and drawing conclusions will be very helpful. Because... The four errors are a sort of distillation of about 10 years of Nietzsche thinking about this. Remember, the congenital defect of philosophers, that's something Nietzsche writes in 78. And it's, uh, he writes Twilight of Idols in 88. So this is, um, this is a refinement of his observations concerning the inherent defects in the way that we philosophize. So what are the four errors, the four great errors? They are as follows. One, the error of confusing cause and effect. Two, the error of false causality. Three, the error of imaginary causes. And four, the error of free will. So notice basically all of these errors concern causality. Actually, not basically, they all do. Even, even the last one about free will, because free will is inextricably bound up with causality, cause and effect. So why do all these errors concern 
causality. Why are these the great errors? All of them have to do with causality. Because when we reason, we proceed from cause to effect, from premise to deduction, from syllogism to the conclusion. Logic is a governing system over relationships, relationships of thought, of qualities, or of values or of ideas. So when we misunderstand those relationships, such as inverting cause and effect, uh, then our logic becomes perverted, or it becomes perverse, rather. So why does this happen? Nietzsche's general rule for understanding why we commit these errors is to look at what we would prefer to believe, what makes us happy to believe, and so on. Um, and usually, then you can <laughs> have a good idea of why our thinking is being motivated in a certain way, um, even though that it's not precisely logically valid, even though it's an error in thought. And so now I'll read from the first of the great errors, the error of confusing cause and effect. Nietzsche writes, quote, there is no more dangerous error than that of mistaking the effect for the cause. I call it the real corruption of reason, end quote. What follows in this passage, uh, Nietzsche starts out, he, he, I'll just kind of summarize, he, he he gives a criticism of a health fad that was going on at the time, brought on by a book by a man named uh, Cornaro. Nietzsche says that this man's slow metabolism was the cause of his long life, but the general public believed that his diet was the cause. And so Cornaro's book, you know, expounds upon his sparse diet, and it causes this health fad, this excitement that he's unlocked the secret to a long life. But Nietzsche says, in fact, the man had a metabolism that led him to eat less, and that's why he lived longer. So the reason why it's reversed, Cornaro's diet is a result of his physiology. His physiology is not a result of his diet. Uh, further down in the passage, he says, quote, the most general formula on which every religion and morality is founded is do this and, and that, refrain from this and that, then you will be happy, end quote. So probably sounds familiar. He's thinking about many of the things he was thinking about when he wrote Human All Too Human. Um, and this is not, I just want to say, uh, to interject here, this is not something Nietzsche's pulling out of nowhere. This was known as the proof by pleasure among the religious apologists, or also known as the proof by strength. Strength here meaning, you know, the belief reveals its strength um, or it reveals its functionality to us and how it improves our lives, how it makes us feel. And so again, there's the bad habit in drawing conclusions here, rather openly stated and admitted by the church that, um, you know, you should believe this because it works, because it's pleasurable, because it seems to have strength or functionality. So we'll continue here with this passage in the, still in the first of the great errors. Quote, the church and morality say a generation, a people are destroyed by license and luxury. My recovered reason says when a people approaches destruction, when it degenerates physiologically, then license and luxury follow from this, namely the craving for ever stronger and more frequent stimulation as every exhausted nature knows it. End quote. So again, a reversal of cause and effect. And, you know, we might note, we see the same argument about licentiousness and decadence employed by, you know, some commentators on the right wing even today. They accuse modern society and culture and suggest, you know, um, decadent, the decadence of society is weakening, weakening us and bringing, bringing down our society. But Nietzsche says you have it backwards. It's not that there is decadence and that it therefore wears down a culture. Rather, a culture is wearing down, and therefore, there is decadence. So, why do we invert cause and effect? Well, the, the key to this, as we keep going, is because it gives pleasure. And this pleasure comes from a feeling of power. Power comes from... It, that. It's a, a big part of that comes from the feeling of knowledge, which is, contains in it a feeling of power. Since knowledge is linked with this pleasurable experience of power... Nietzsche explains this in Human All to Human, aphorism 252, and I will also quote from this in an abridged form. Quote, Why is knowledge linked to pleasure? First and foremost, because by it we gain awareness of our power. 
Second, because as we gain knowledge, we surpass older ideas and their representatives and become victors. Third, because any new knowledge, however small, makes us feel superior to everyone and unique in understanding this matter correctly. End quote. And so it's more, it's more pleasurable to believe, as in the example of Cornaro, that one's life or health is improved because they did the right thing, which means knowing the right thing and having the power to do the right thing. So we reverse the cause and the effect. Ordering them in the proper relationship would actually take away the sense of having power in the moral realm or having power in the intellectual realm. That, I mean, they're deeply related because if you, know, you, if you remember, the, those are two premises that are the foundation of civilization. Know thyself and all things in moderation. Remember those two maxims of the Greeks, you know. So if if your knowledge and your motivations for your actions are simply a superficial after effect of processes which are unconscious, that takes away the feeling of power. It, it, it generally does not gladden the heart to think so, and so we don't. So the next error, the error of false causality. As I mentioned earlier, we read from this passage before when talking about free will, um, which heavily relates to a lot of Nietzsche, what Nietzsche is talking about here. To summarize this particular era, error, Nietzsche criticizes the belief in the ego or in the consciousness as this unchanged immutable fact. He says that the inner world is, quote, full of phantoms and will-o'-the-wisps. The will is one of them. And it's merely a surfaced phenomenon of consciousness. He brings up the ego, knowing the knowing and the acting subject, because it's uh, it's precisely this ego to which we attribute this false causality. So, building on Nietzsche's insights and the analysis of the first error, we start from the existence of something. A thing exists, therefore it's legitimate. So we have this experience of having a will. And we reason backwards from that experience, from the effect to the cause, you know, and, and in this case, from our actions to these, this idea of these freely chosen motivations. Um, and that ends up coagulating over, over time into this idea of the ego through our habit. So we're starting from a conclusion, reasoning to the premises, and we, we, we create the ego as this thing with substance. Nietzsche writes in this section that mankind, quote, took the concept of being from the concept of the ego. He posited things as being in his image, according, in accordance with his concept of the ego as a cause, end quote. And further down in the passage, he says, even your Adam, my dear mechanists and physicists, how much error, how much rudimentary psychology is still residual in your Adam, not to mention the thing in itself the error of the spirit as cause, mistaken for reality, end quote. Again, uh, I feel I should bring this up whenever Nietzsche criticizes atomism. He's not talking about atoms as we understand it today, but the idea of the atom in the sense that Democritus wrote about, the atom as the smallest possible unit of matter as the sort of explanation for matter the sort of the justification for what matter is. Um, you know, it's like you, it goes smaller, smaller, smaller until you hit the smallest possible unit, the atom. And Nietzsche is saying that there is still, um, there's error and rudimentary psychology residual in that idea. Um, so the second great error, the error of false causality, it's the error of reifying a cause. To reify, it's to make something into a thing. So, Causality, if we were to accept it as an explanation, would be this vast interlinking chain that stretches back into infinity. It ultimately results in the requirement that we either believe in a self-caused cause or an infinite regress, um, which both of those have their logical problems. That's the same problem with atomism, by the way. It's, it's atoms all the way down. <laughs> um, so eventually... You know, you just say, you get to like, there's bed, bedrock of reality, bedrock of matter. There just is this thing that's the smallest unit of matter. Or you can keep going. See, and that's the thing, that's kind of where we are now in physics. 
seems like we can always find smaller and smaller particles or subatomic particles, um, unless you're a string theorist or something like that. Um, anyway, <laughs> to back on back on the topic, in in the world of becoming, right? This this Heraclitian worldview of Nietzsche. Um, that's what Nietzsche believes in, as opposed to, or rather than a world of being. Um, in this world of becoming, causality doesn't make any sense. Um, you know, Nietzsche believes it's owing to the tricks of language that we have to attribute or invest being into the concept of a cause. And so we therefore make things which are phantoms or will-o'-the-wisps, as he puts it, into things with substance so that we can have a cause as a thing. And that is the ego. So the next error is the error of imaginary causes. And Nietzsche gives the example here of dreams. Uh, another parallel with human all too human. Dreams are, are given as an example of our bad habits and drawing conclusions all the way back into in that book, in um, part one of Human All Too Human. Um, in that book, he uses the example of the tolling of a bell. Here in this passage in Twilight of Idols, he uses the example of a cannon shot. Nietzsche writes that in a dream, quote, a cause is slipped under a particular sensation. For example, following a far-off cannon shot, often a whole little novel in which the dreamer turns up as protagonist. What is really later, the motivation, is experienced first, often with a hundred details which pass like lightning, and the shot follows. What has happened? The representations which were produced by a certain state have been misunderstood as its causes, end quote. So hopefully you can see, as we've gone through this, how each of these errors that Nietzsche is discussing builds one upon the other, and all are related as fallacious habits of our thought. It's like seeing different angles, but it's all the same structure. The representation, um, the the image or the concept we have of, of this experience or the feeling, that's what becomes most real to us. Um, but this is what this is what should be properly called an effect but we make it a cause. The, again, the reversal of cause and effect. The specific element that Nietzsche is pointing out here in error number three is that when an effect is produced and we don't even know the cause, we will still just go ahead and invent one. The mind will fill that void and produce a cause. So he continues, quote, in fact, we do the same thing when awake. Most of our general feelings, every kind of inhibition, pressure, tension, and explosion in the play and counterplay of our organs, and particularly the state of the nervous sympathicus, excite our causal instinct. We want to have a reason for feeling this way or that, for feeling bad or feeling good, end quote. So notice he says instinct. That means um, there's a use for these errors, a use which evolved. Rather than seeing cause and effect as obvious and universal, like those eternal truths we talked about earlier, Nietzsche not only challenges this framework as being logically perilous, but then he focuses on why we would have developed this mode of thought. And so before moving on to error number four, Nietzsche then gives a psychological explanation for this process up to this point. And he says, quote, with the unknown... One is confronted with danger, discomfort, and care. The first instinct is to abolish these painful states. First principle, any explanation is better than none. Since at bottom it is merely a matter of wishing to be rid of oppressive representations, one is not too particular about the means of getting rid of them. The first representation that explains the unknown as familiar feels so good that one considers it true. The proof of pleasure, of strength, as a criterion of truth, end quote. And so again, we have the reference to the proof by pleasure, or the proof of pleasure. And uh, this is also related to the passage we cited earlier about the pleasure of gaining knowledge and the sense of power that comes with gaining knowledge. And Nietzsche concludes that the whole realm of morality and religion belongs to this domain of imaginary causes. He then quotes uh, from Schopenhauer, and this is related to the criticism he made of Schopenhauer in Human All to Human about the feeling of guilt as a justification for free will. 
The quotation from Schopenhauer he selects here in Twilight of Idols, he, he quotes from Schopenhauer in World as Will and Representation, book two, aphorism number 666. That's kind of funny. Um, <laughs> and that's pretty metal of you, Nietzsche, to pick that one to quote from. Uh, it gives context as to why Schopenhauer thought the way he did about guilt. Uh, quote, every great pain, whether physical or spiritual, declares what we deserve, for it could not come to use if we did not deserve it, end quote. So Schopenhauer, Schopenhauer um, he states here what the average person tends to believe, even if they don't say it in such explicit terms. All bad feelings are produced by sin or they're deserved in some sense, according to you know conventional wisdom or to, in Nietzsche's time, religious wisdom. The explanation of agreeable feelings, meanwhile, comes from trust in God or from faith or, or you know, the, um, the consciousness of one's good deeds, the good conscience that one might have. And so Nietzsche goes on to write, quote, In truth, all these supposed explanations are resultant states and, as it were, translations of pleasurable or unpleasurable feelings into a false dialect, end quote. And so we might say that the church's doctrine of proof by pleasure is actually a rather honest uh, form of error, wouldn't, wouldn't, wouldn't we say? It's awareness that our beliefs are simply translations of what makes us happy or you know, serves our interests or boosts our self-image, what comports with the demands of society or with our own irrational moral demands. Our beliefs are translations of these things into ideological terms. So the final error is, of course, the error of free will, which we've already covered extensively, and which is related to the criticism of Schopenhauer above uh, that we already went over. So I'm not going to focus so much on the arguments for or against free will here, but rather on Nietzsche's psychoanalysis of why people believe in free will, which you should have some inkling of, um, based on everything we've talked about. But what feeling, what, what is the feeling that is being translated into the free will ideology? What is that gladdening feeling sitting at the bottom of the free will doctrine that we then transform into an explanation, into this philosophical idea? And so Nietzsche writes, quote, Wherever responsibilities are sought, it is usually the instinct of wanting to judge and punish which is at work. Becoming has been deprived of its innocence when any being such and such is traced back to will, to purposes, to acts of responsibility. The doctrine of the will has been invented essentially for the purpose of punishment, that is, because one, one wanted to impute guilt. Men were considered free so that they might be judged and punished, so that they might become guilty. Consequently, every act had to be considered as willed. The origin of every act had to be considered as lying within consciousness. End quote. And so, um, and I, I quoted from that error also in an abridged form. I kind of skipped across a big section there in the middle, but the message, the thrust of that is perfectly plain in my opinion. Men are considered free so that they can be made guilty. It's very clear in the history of Christian thought, and this same tendency eventually became secularized and made its way into Enlightenment thought as well, and we can definitely see it at work today among people who are not religious at all. The free will of man in the story of Christianity is more or less a means of making mankind responsible and thus deserving of punishment. And so the point of the free will doctrine, which rests on all these errors of thinking, actually makes perfect sense when we instead look to why someone would want to believe in this doctrine, and we realize that it's pleasurable to be able to make people responsible, to hold people accountable, to make them guilty, to blame them, and so on. This satisfies our will to power, or rather it's, it's one means among many that men use to secretly serve will to power by all these little bypaths. So, there's only one final passage that I want to cover in this episode, um, but it's 
<laughs> it's going to require that we get into the weeds a bit here. So if you've been if you've been with me uh, up to this point, hopefully you're ready for this um, because we're going to go into overdrive here uh, philosophically a little bit. And hopefully you've been listening to the podcast from the beginning. You've built up all your um, background and a lot of things we've been talking about. But this I wanted to look at basically what I would consider to be an application of all that we've learned about Nietzsche's analysis of bad thinking. Um, you know, whereas it, a lot of the other passages we've gone over, the application of the idea is actually rather self-explanatory, right? It's just Nietzsche saying, well, people believe in X, Y, or Z because it makes them feel good or something to that effect. But here, Nietzsche takes on um, perhaps the most influential philosopher in Germany and maybe even all of Europe up to that point in history, and he shows how one of his most influential ideas was itself just another example of erroneous thinking brought on by this congenital defect of philosophers. And again, since we've gone over so much now, since talking about the original birth defect, remember that defect is the lack of historical sense, the failure to recognize that humanity and indeed all life is a product of evolution. Again, using evolution in a broad extended sense and all all life in the world is still evolving. It's in a constant dynamic state. Even saying it's in a dynamic state, you can see how we fall into the victim of uh, tricks of language, as Nietzsche would say. The, the lack of the historical sense, again, to recap, leads to this belief in eternal truths, or man is a fixed quantity, and then the philosopher then inevitably invests mankind, you know, as this fixed quantity with the traits and qualities that he perceives in mankind in his own time and place. The ideas of mankind, the beliefs of mankind within the philosopher's own culture are seen as innate. Um, so what Nietzsche discusses in the following passage uh, I'm going to bring up um, is the idea of synthetic judgments a priori. And um, so you may have figured out who we're going to be talking about. We're going to be talking about Immanuel Kant. Now, if you aren't familiar with Kant, um, which I'm just going to assume, I'm go I always try, you've probably figured it out by now on this podcast, but I always try to make it so that if you come in completely cold, hopefully you will still have a workable knowledge that all this will be comprehensible. There's no pre-reading you have to do to listen to this podcast, although it certainly probably helps, I would imagine. But um, we're going to talk a bit about Kant's philosophy before we get to the passage I mentioned, um, because his ideas bear some explaining. So we have to understand two different distinctions that Kant made between types of judgment uh, in order to really understand the basics of Kant's philosophy. The first is between analytic judgments and synthetic judgments. Analytic judgments can be derived simply through an extrapolation of the meaning of a word or concept. Analytic judgments are judgments about a thing which add no additional information external to the meaning of the words already used or the concepts already used. So this will become clear with an example. Um, so uh, all, all bachelors are unmarried. That's an analytic statement or an analytic judgment. Because the concept of a bachelor contains the idea of being unmarried. We haven't added anything to the concept of the bachelor by saying they're all unmarried. The statement is true by definition, as it were. Um, a synthetic judgment, on the other hand, is a statement in which the predicate is distinct from the subject, where the judgment requires that we, we bring together the original concept with some external information in order to glean new knowledge. So a synthetic judgment might be uh, Keegan, the host of the Nietzsche podcast, is married. So it's not contained in the definition of, you know, what I am, that I must be married in order for the concept of Keegan to exist. There was a time, in fact, when I wasn't married. So we take the subject Keegan, me, and this synthetic judgment or synthetic statement I've just made provides new information by introducing or modifying that, it, it introduces the, the external information of my marital status, right? Now, analytic versus synthetic judgments, that's not the only kind of distinction Kant made. 
Um, he also differentiated between a priori and a posteriori judgments. Um, and in my opinion, the quickest way to get this across is that these roughly correlate with like the traditional divide between the rationalist and empiricist types of epistemology. So a priori judgments are those judgments which are made solely by logical deduction, whereas a posteriori judgments are those which require some information about the external world. So sense data or just information you would glean through experience, right? Okay, so why have we gone to these lengths to describe these types of distinctions between different types of human reasoning? Well, Kant's assessment of the empiricist rationalist divide in philosophy that had been going on for hundreds of years at that point is that in so many words, the confusion between these two camps is because of the fact that no one had before took made both of these distinctions and then took that through to its logical conclusions. So what does that mean? To simplify things for the sake of clarity, Kant would basically say the empiricists were making synthetic a posteriori judgments. That means judgments about the external world based on experience where new information is added by, you know, adding, uh, combining a subject and predicate, new information that's not contained in the meaning of the concepts that we already know and understand. So these are the facts on the ground, so to speak. This is a, this is a type of knowledge we all understand. It's scientific knowledge, right? Empiricism. And then the rationalists, they're making analytic a priori judgments. That's where we take a word or a concept and we try to de determine what we mean by that concept. What's implied by the meaning of the concept. We apply the laws of logic, such as the law of non-contradiction to the concept to determine like all of the implications. And so this is philosophy done solely within the domain of logic, proceeding from the logical necessities created by accepting certain definitions. And that's should be very familiar to us too, because that's what you have to do every time you have a philosophical debate, right? Is agree to definitions, and then you see what logically follows from accepting a series of definitions and concepts. So, but now, what if we start swapping around these categories a bit? What if, could we have analytic a posteriori judgments? Now, Kant says those types of judgments don't occur, because what would that mean to make a judgment that is both analytic? and a posteriori. It would mean that we would be appealing to experience or sense data in order to prove like a logical deduction, which is entirely contained within the meaning of the concept. Like, and so that doesn't make sense. You don't need any like sense in any, any empirical data to prove that all bachelors are married um, because the concept of a bachelor is defined as an unmarried man. And that's note, Note here that that's completely separate from the issue of whether there actually are any unmarried men or like any claims about the external world. You know, another example might be two halves always create a whole, right? The definition of the term half necessarily leads to the conclusion that two halves create a whole. It's contained in the meaning of the term half, and no amount of sense data could ever change that, right? If we find two halves that don't create a whole, that just means that those quote unquote halves didn't actually fit the definition of a half. Um, it, it, nothing will disprove that two halves make a whole. And so analytic a posteriori judgments, those don't seem to be able to, the, the, those aren't really possible, right? So analytic a posteriori judgments are out. But what about the fourth option? Synthetic judgments a priori. This means judgments that are not merely contained within the definition of a term. So judgments that actually yield some meaning external to the starting concept that we're trying to learn about. Judgments which are expand our knowledge about the world, but which are derived not from sense experience, but from logical deduction. Could such a thing be possible? And Kant says, yes. And he says that this is the domain of mathematics and geometry, and of metaphysics even. So synthetic judgments a priori yield new information that is necessarily true, but which is not contained within the concept itself. So the, the interior angles of a triangle add up to a straight line. That fact is not contained within the concept of a triangle, 
by it's not within the mere definition and yet it's not proved by experience either we can we can deduce such a thing through mathematics alone and thus Kant's sort of triumph in philosophy is in his claim that yes synthetic judgments a priori do exist and that when we consider the domain of mathematics for example everyone will be at for, be forced to admit that they do but there's a sort of a complication of this because the question naturally arises as to how such a thing could be possible. Kant has demonstrated um, that it can be done with mathematics, but the question is how. We can give an explanation as to how we can make synthetic a posteriori judgments, which is to say, you know, empirical judgments based on experience. We take sense, sense data and we draw these conclusions. We, we, we have experiences through our sense organs, for example, and then we draw conclusions from that by experience. But as Hume argued, and Kant agreed with Hume, no empirical judgment we make can ever really be known to be universal, we, right? We can make no claims of universality or necessity just based on observing the external world. Why? Well, because the fact that you've observed something one time, or even a thousand times, or a million times, doesn't mean you might get a different result the next time. This is often referred to as the problem of induction. Uh, meanwhile, on the other hand, analytic judgments must be done a priori, as we've already discussed, and because they're necessarily true, in Kant's view, they cannot depend on sensory data. They have to be de done through deduction, and these types of judgments don't touch what, the actual world, quote-unquote. Of course, it gets a little complicated because of the the world in itself versus mere appearance, but we're going to leave that aside for right now. So how can we learn things that are necessarily true and universally true without depending on sense data, which, you know, sense data which can't get us to universality, and without depending on arguing strictly through inference based on definition, which cannot actually impart new information? Again, to oversimplify a, a bit, but to, to try and get the essence, the core thrust, Kant's argument boils down to the fact that synthetic a priori judgments must be possible in order for us to make the judgments that we do about mathematics or about metaphysics. He's pointing to the fact that we do make these judgments. We agree, therefore, implicitly with the basis of these judgments, whatever they may be. And furthermore, Kant argues, we make these judgments correctly, the proof is in the pudding, so to speak. The judgments work. And so finally, we must conclude that synthetic a priori judgments must be possible by means of some faculty of human reasoning that allows us to make these judgments. So have you noticed anything yet? Viability, functionality, legitimacy. So finally, we come to Nietzsche. This passage is uh, in Beyond Good and Evil, Book 1, Aphorism 11, where Nietzsche writes that Kant was, quote, proud of having discovered a new faculty in man, the faculty for synthetic judgments a priori, end quote. Um, and further down in the passage, he writes, quote, but let us reflect. It is high time to do so. How are synthetic judgments a priori possible, Kant asked himself. And what really is his answer? by virtue of a faculty. But so circumstantially, venerably, and with such a display of German profundity and curlicues that people simply failed to note the comical nésorie allemande involved in such an answer. End quote. So what is the answer? By virtue of a faculty. The original German here is Vermoga eines Vermogens. To bring out the, the silliness here, that Nietzsche is pointing to, we might say, by virtue of some virtue, or by means of a means, as uh, Kaufman notes in the footnote to the passage. And the term Nazare Allemande is French. You could translate it as German foolishness. You know, through his rigor and his, his overt seriousness and the graveness of his self-appointed task, Kant hides the fact that his conclusion, for all its brilliance, rests on the same bad habits. So, continuing with the passage, um, 
once again in an abridged form, quote, People were actually beside themselves with delight over this new faculty, and the jubilation reached its climax when Kant further discovered a moral faculty in man. The honeymoon of German philosophy arrived. All the young theologians of Tübingen Seminary went into the bushes, all looking for faculties. No one could yet distinguish between finding and inventing. End quote. And a, another quick note here. Finding and inventing. The words are finden and erfinden. So there's a pun in there that doesn't quite come off in English, but, um, you know, they're unable to distinguish between discovering something in the sense of an invention or discovering something in the sense of an observation. Um, and Nietzsche is suggesting maybe it was really an invention. Back to the passage. Quote, By virtue of a faculty, he has said, or at least meant, but is that an answer? An explanation? Or is it not rather merely a repetition of the question? How does opium induce sleep? By virtue of a faculty, namely the virtus dormativa, replies the doctor in Moliere. Quia est neo virtus dormativa, cujus est natura sensus a supire. End quote. And that's Nietzsche, just to explain again, quoting from a play, Moliere, a comedy. And the, the doctor is asked, how does it opium induce sleep? And the translation of the doctor's answer is, because it contains a sleepy faculty whose nature it is to put the senses to sleep. So it's, <laughs> you can see how he's saying it's merely a re repetition of the question. Uh, returning now to the passage again, quote, But such replies belong in comedy. And it is high time to replace the Kantian question, how are synthetic judgments a priori possible, by another question. Why is belief in such judgments necessary? And to comprehend that such judgments must be believed to be true for the sake of preservation of creatures just like ourselves, though they might, of course, be false judgments for all that. Or, to speak more clearly, synthetic judgments a priori should not be possible at all. We have no right to them. In our mouths, they are nothing but false judgments. Only, of course, the belief in their truth is necessary as a foreground belief and visual evidence belonging to the perspective optics of life. End quote. So Nietzsche's answer to all this is that the fact that we determine that we need such judgments in order to do mathematics, for instance, it's not proof of anything. It's the same old error of thought, of thinking in reverse, starting from the conclusion, starting from our demands upon the world, whether they be moral or metaphysical or religious, and then reasoning from that to the conclusion. Um, and as Nietzsche points out, Kant discovers not only this faculty for synthetic judgments a priori, but also a moral faculty in mankind. And what is the result? It's the honeymoon of German philosophy. So another way of saying this, in a, in a much more pithy analysis of Kant uh, by Nietzsche, is in The Gay Science, Aphorism 193, and it's called Kant's Joke. Quote, Kant wanted to prove in a way that would dumbfound the whole world that the whole world was right. That was the secret joke of the soul. He wrote against the scholars in favor of popular prejudice, but for scholars and not for the people, end quote. So I think we see here the congenital defect of philosophers, as Nietzsche saw it, in Kant. Though he, he spun out the densest, most Byzantine, most abstruse philosophical texts, Kant's ultimate aim was the validation of the moral and metaphysical prejudices of common people of Christian Europe, and specifically of Germany. He was rescuing the metaphysical and the moral world from the effects of secularism that threatened to render everything relative and questionable. And so, whereas other philosophers would not tend to see a sort of psychological need in Kant's theorizing, um, because it's some of the most unemotional, 
you know, cold, detached, logical stuff you'll ever read. Nietzsche argues that it's plain as day once you get down to the heart of the matter and, and recognize that what sits at the center of Kant's philosophy is a demand. It's a need. These types of judgments might be valid or they may not be. That wouldn't change how necessary they are to beings like ourselves. And they might even be false judgments for all that, as Nietzsche writes. Um, but they would still be just as necessary if they're false. And so we can see here the way that Nietzsche goes about criticizing other philosophers in full effect. Notice he doesn't tear down Kant. He doesn't like critique every last point of Kant's philosophy. He goes straight to the heart. He takes a psychological approach. And in this respect, Nietzsche is ironically more devoted to a strict epistemology than Kant and arguably more skeptical than Hume because he's willing even to indict his own deeply held beliefs and admit they may not be true. It's simply that we need them. And so the question naturally arises, is Nietzsche subject to the congenital defect of philosophers? Can these criticisms be applied to Nietzsche himself? Does Nietzsche reason backwards at times? from his own irrational demands? Does Nietzsche choose to believe what gladdens his heart or make judgments about mankind which are indelibly linked to his own time and place? The answer to those questions, in my view, I think is fairly obvious. No one escapes, and Nietzsche doesn't even suggest that he could escape. He's simply aware of his own congenital defect, and yet, you know, what, what a Pandora's box that opens. Because it leads us to ask, what kind of effect would it have on one's philosophy to be aware of how perspectival the entire project is? If everything's provisional, a means to an end, a demand for beings such as ourselves, as he says, can we trust somebody who thinks like that? Can we trust Nietzsche? Um, these are all wonderful and terrifying questions to ask, um, and they're questions that Nietzsche almost beckons us to ask. And they cannot be answered here because the thrust of Nietzsche's project is not to instill in his readers an absolute trust in himself as a philosopher, but a healthy distrust and not just in Nietzsche, but in the entire lot of philosophers 